I'm not sure where we are as a country right now um, and whether we can stay focused on something like this, uh, whether our president can stay focused on something like this. Well, the whole administration just seems to me like completely out to lunch. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Americans are so polarized that even when almost everyone basically agrees about something, their instincts tell them to distrust it. That's what's happening in the discussion about Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Virtually no one outside of the fever swamps of the far right or far left thinks that the invasion launched by Russia's authoritarian leader Vladimir Putin isn't an atrocity, let alone one that is defensible in any way. Even those who express skepticism that the threats to Ukraine were anything that Americans should be concerned about have largely conceded that they were wrong in the face of videos showing cities under siege, civilian casualties, and millions of refugees fleeing for their lives in the wake of Russia's onslaught, there is only one possible response. Sympathy and a desire to help. But despite that seeming consensus, there is no real agreement about the significance of these events or what the United States should do about it. Everyone agrees that the Ukrainians need help. But sadly, it's far from clear that even a massive shipment of arms from the West or crippling sanctions on Russia will be sufficient to force an end to the fighting or restore Ukraine's territorial integrity, even if a ceasefire is put in place. The Ukrainian request for the NATO alliance to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine is a non-starter, since that would make combat between Western and Russian forces a certainty. Starting a war between nuclear powers is likely to make things a lot worse for the Ukrainians and the entire world. Still, it's heartening to see that when faced with naked aggression by an authoritarian power against a weaker neighbor, the usual stark divides between Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals have broken down. The cheers for liberals taking up arms to defend their liberty ought to remind Americans of the need to defend their own. That aside, hopefully this will soon prompt the Biden administration to stop pulling its punches on economic sanctions, as well as to take action to expand expand energy exploration and drilling so as to return to a position where Russian oil is no longer needed, despite an ideological commitment to ending the use of fossil fuels, which has increased Putin's leverage. It may well be hyperbole to say that Ukraine and its brave leader, President Vladimir Zelensky are the avatars of democracy, but the courage shown by him and his people as they have held their own against the Russians, despite fearful odds, has gained them the affection of a broad cross-section of Americans, as well as international opinion. It's also true that this tragedy might have been avoided had President Joe Biden not convinced Putin of his weakness by lifting the sanctions former President Donald Trump had imposed on the Russians' Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to Europe coupled with his disgraceful withdrawal last summer from Afghanistan. At the same time, the fact that some on the right, notably Fox News' Tucker Carlson, seemed to be willing to act as Putin apologists right up until the invasion also encouraged the Russian autocrat. They were under the delusion that concerns about Ukraine were plot by warmongering neoconservatives and that anything that Biden and the liberal media saw as bad must somehow not be so awful. That was wrong, even if the mainstream media's years of open bias on so many issues made it hard to believe anything they reported. But further recriminations, including the debate over whether NATO expansion has saved the Baltic republics and Poland from Ukraine's fate, or whether it made the invasion of Ukraine inevitable, must be left to historians. What matters most now is not why this debacle occurred. Rather, it's that no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, Putin's invasion has rallied American and international opinion behind the sound concept that aggressors should be resisted and punished. To reassert this principle is not, however, a romantic notion or a way to relive past chapters of history. Ukraine is not a rerun of the Spanish Civil War that took place in the 1930s, which was widely, if sometimes inappropriately, referred to as a rehearsal for World War II. Bad as he is, 
Putin isn't Adolf Hitler. Moreover, what is at stake in this struggle isn't so much the idea of preserving democracy as it is realizing that there is a new axis of rogue nations that need to be stopped. Ukraine is not a perfect democracy, and in the past, its nationalist movement has been associated with dark moments in world history that were particularly painful and bloody for the Jewish people. Still, its citizens deserve the right to self-determination and to not have foreign rule imposed on them. International support for them isn't merely justified under the circumstances of an unprovoked war. It is an imperative. That is true, even it's being expressed in ways that reflect the profound lack of seriousness of many sectors of American society. Pouring out vodka with a Russian name, though it's manufactured in the United States, is the sort of empty gesture that led to renaming sauerkraut victory cabbage during the First World War to demonstrate hostility to Germany, or to dub French fries freedom fries when France didn't support America during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. The fact that some arts organizations are now banning Russian artists for not denouncing Putin, even if they denounce his war, is equally pointless, unfair, since doing so would endanger their families and turn them into permanent exiles, and mere virtue signaling. More importantly, the laser-like focus on Russia and its aggression also misses the larger significance of the current state of international affairs. What is often lost in the understandable outrage against Putin is that he is allied with China, which is supporting his aggression, an ominous portent for the people of Taiwan who live under a similar threat of invasion from Beijing. Equally important is that Russia is also aligned with Iran, and that Biden's dream of a new, even weaker nuclear deal with Tehran that will pose an existential threat to Israel, Arab nations, and the West was made possible with Russian help. The fact that Americans who are up in arms about Ukraine seem largely indifferent to the genocide China is carrying out in its Western provinces against the Uyghurs doesn't mean that hostility to Putin is wrong. It just shows how poorly informed they are and how myopic and how wrongheaded their leaders have been. Putin's authoritarian nationalism has nothing in common with the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party or the fanatical Shia Islamism that is the governing ideology of the Iranian theocracy. But all three share a desire to dominate the Western democracies and to impose a new age of reaction on the world. The more powerful these nations get, and China is on the brink of becoming a genuine superpower rival to the United States, the more dangerous the world becomes. Seen in that light, the need to contain Putin's Russia and to do everything short of a nuclear world to roll back his aggression is clear. Understanding this basic fact of international life is not to be confused with a crusade aimed at imposing democracy on nations and cultures that either don't want or can't handle it, nor is it equivalent to a desire for America to act as the imperial policeman of the world. The genius of the post-Second World War system of alliances was that it was based on the notion that collective security is not based on hostility to nationalism per se, or a desire to impose a Pax Americana on the world. Instead, it was a way of understanding that foreign conflicts must sometimes be viewed in a broader context, it requires America to act in defense of its interests and those of its democratic allies. Americans should care about what's happening in Ukraine and do what they can, short of war, to stop it and to aid those in need. But for the Ameri administration to demand the rollback of Russian aggression, while at the same time seeking to enrich and empower an equally dangerous Iranian regime, and also failing to resist Chinese expansionism or its crimes against humanity, is an appalling misjudgment and utterly unfettered from either morality or sound foreign policy principles. And now to the interview of the week. Americans are deeply caught up in a wave of sympathy for Ukraine and outrage at the authoritarian government of Russia led by Vladimir Putin, which has launched a brutal war to subjugate its neighbor. As a result, that seems to be the only story on the news right now and the only issue that is motivating comment or activism. But while most of us are focused on helping refugees and supporting aid for the embattled Ukrainians, as well as complaining about the impotence of Western leaders whose weakness helps set these events in motion, 
Few are pondering exactly what will come next or what this war will mean for the future of American foreign policy. Will it spark a comeback of support for efforts to project American power abroad to prevent further Ukraines, either in Europe or in Asia, as Taiwan warily eyes the ambitions of communist China to treat them the way Putin is treating Ukraine? Or is this all just a temporary burst of enthusiasm, motivated by horrible videos as well as a vague sense that underdogs deserve sympathy, that will dissipate once the cable news channels find another compelling story? Are Americans so transfixed by Ukraine that they are ignoring other issues that deserve attention, such as the Biden administration's appeasement of Iran, as well as runaway inflation and a surge of illegal immigration across a porous southern border, which they seem to care less about than lines on European maps? More importantly, as the panic about the coronavirus pandemic seems to be dissipating, Will voters forget what was done to them and their children over the past two years as lockdowns that ruined lives and businesses, but likely did little to stop the virus and mass mandates that were equally futile became political symbols, regardless of the damage they were doing, especially to children. To discuss all this, we have with us today one of the sharpest commentators on American politics and society writing today. Carol Markowitz is a weekly columnist at the New York Post and Fox News, contributing editor at The Spectator and a contributing writer to the Washington Examiner magazine. She's also written for The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Newsweek, and many others. She appears regularly on Fox News, Newsmax, OANN, and Fox Business Network. She's currently writing a book on how wokeness destroys childhood. Carol was born in the Soviet Union and grew up in Brooklyn. She now lives in South Florida with her husband and three children. Carol Markowitz, welcome to Top Story. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're thrilled to have you on. Um, Carol, I want to start with the only story people are talking about this week, or seemingly, uh, the yep. war in Ukraine. Um, as someone who was born in the former Soviet Union, who's connected to the Russian Jewish community in the United States, yeah. what's your take on Putin's invasion? What do you think caused it? What do you think the United States should do about it? Well, I, I mean, in simple, you know, simple terms, I don't like it. <laughs> um, okay, I, I like to think we're all agreed on that, but somehow maybe not. No, but. maybe not. Um, I have family in both Russia and Ukraine still. Uh, my father was from Ukraine. My mother's from Russia. So uh, I'm sort of the the perfect person right now, except, you know, I, I, I haven't followed very closely what was going on there uh, in the time leading up to this. Um, definitely people in Russia that I speak to have said, you know, Putin has a great reason for doing this. Um, Ukraine was trying to join with NATO to oppose him, but clearly that's they're they're getting very one-dimensional news there, um, and it, it, we really just can't you know can't rely on uh, what we hear from them at all. Uh, and then my family in Ukraine evacuated about less than a week ago. Um, it's all women, and they finally decided to leave Kharkov, where my grandma, <clears throat> my grandmother, had lived in her adult life. Yeah, well, I guess the you know the question is sort of from an American point of view is after Iraq and Afghanistan, the general assumption yeah. was that there was a bipartisan consensus against American interventions in foreign conflicts. I mean, Republicans right. and Democrats. Mm -hmm. Do you think the sympathy for Ukraine and the hostility to Russia, which is motivated to some degree by the way Russia and Ukraine were used as political footballs to discredit uh, Donald Trump, yeah. has changed that? Um, you know, would Americans, for example, put up with a higher, higher gas prices if it meant punishing Putin? Right. And I guess I, I guess my question, because trying to put it in historical perspective, is is Ukraine becoming like what the Spanish Civil War was to the West in the 1930s, a place to play out our political ideologies amid a confusing and bloody foreign po right. foreign war? It's interesting. Or, or is there really some key moral issue of our time that's involved here? I, I think it's all of that, actually. Um, I you know I, I've tweeted this, but I my first thought when I open my eyes in the morning is if Zelensky is still alive. I just mm -hmm. you know I have. Um, obviously, little personal connection to this conflict, um, but I definitely am rooting for him. Something in me is rooting for him. I mean, obviously, the fact that he's Jewish is uh, a 
some part of that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think Americans love a hero story. They love an underdog story. The Ukraine uh, situation fits very neatly into that. And I, so I, I don't blame them for, um, you know, seeing seeing a position here and taking it. And the fact is that Russia is an eternal kind of enemy of the United States. I mean, it's just part of, part of our history here. And I, yeah. I've always sort of felt that uh, we, we never really recovered from the Cold War. We never really became friendly with Russia, right? We were never um, on good terms with them. They were always sort of the, the superpower over there that we were always going to be worried about. And I, I'm not sure that that's wrong. I, I think that that's probably the right thing to, to see them as. Um, so from an American perspective, I think it, it absolutely would be good if Ukraine beats back Russia and weakens Putin. Um, and then from just a worldwide, you know, rooting for the underdog, same thing. Um, I think it, mm -hmm. it absolutely would help. And also the examples of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan are, I mean, you know, if you really look at it, it, it yeah, we, you know, we, we had spent time in those countries for decades, uh, but who won? Who, you know, we didn't really achieve our overwhelming goals of turning them into free countries. I mean, I remember the, you know, I was very, very into it too. I, you know, I admit I, I was completely sold on the idea of bringing democracy to places like Iraq. Um, that obviously didn't happen. And I, it's interesting that Ukraine win, you know, not winning, but so far holding their own is such a kind of surprise to everybody when this keeps happening, when in, invading larger army uh, invades a country and the civilians of the country fight back. I mean, we've seen this again and again. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point. There is some commonality there, although obviously there are differences. Um, and you're right, certainly, that we failed um, in yeah. Iraq. Um, and we certainly failed in Afghanistan um, for a number of reasons. I mean, <laughs> they're back where they were 20 odd years ago. Right. Um, and I, I guess, though, I mean, some of our colleagues, you know, in uh, in the conservative movement, um, mm -hmm. are worried that this is sort of the return of neoconservatism, you know, inventorism. Some worry that this could start a new, even start a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Do, are you worried at all about that, or do you see this as sort of something that can be contained? Well, I don't see. I, you know, the the nuclear war concern. I don't see it as. Uh, because we're getting in, you know, because we would put boots on the ground in Ukraine, which I, you know, I don't think we would do. Um, but, you know, we are. No, I, I, I think there's very little chance of that. I mean, right, no chance, right. actually. But even the no fly zone, you know, Amer there was a poll recently that Americans so support the no fly zone. I think if it was explained to them that the no fly zone means that we would shoot down Russian planes and potentially get into a nuclear war with Russia, I think they might oppose it at that point. Um, oh, I think they would definitely, I think that would, you know, that, they, that's kind of a poll. It, you know, we, we both know that polls are, you know, right. polls can be, you know leading yeah. questions. That's as yeah. leading a question as, as right. you can get. Do you think you Russia should stop killing Ukrainians? Like, yes, yes, I do. Right. <laughs> um, it, it really it, it really is hard to say um, where that line is going to be. We, we, we're supplying arms to Ukraine. We're um, definitely helping them strategically by, uh, you know, sanctioning Russia by now today, you know, not no longer buying their oil, etc. So at what point is Russia going to see America's behavior as an act of war anyway? Um, and, and it's hard to say also because we have no real information on what Putin is like. You know, there's this, this Putin is a madman um, thing, but is he? We have no we have no real idea of what's going on there. He might not be. I mean, he is he trigger happy? Potentially. We really just don't know. Yeah, there, there are a lot of debates in here. Part of it is about NATO, you know, did... Did the expansion of NATO to Russia's border, in this case, save the Baltic republics and Poland, or did it just make war in Ukraine, you know, inevitable? I mean, right. you, you noted that Russians that you know, you know, feel that this is, you know, was a causes belli. I mean, yeah. I've speak, spoken to Russians mm -hmm. and I felt as if their approach to foreign policy was based on the issue of, well, Poland invaded Russia in 1605, so therefore... <laughs> You know, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, right. We remember, right? Um, but I, I guess the 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 other point about this is, you know, sort of where does you know where does it lead? Um, and 
I guess the other angle I think specifically I'm interested in is sort of the Jewish angle. Zelensky is definitely playing the Jewish card. Yeah. Which he's which in his position, I guess he's entitled to do. Sure. There's been some, I think, some unfair judging of Israel, which is in a very different strategic position than the United States, because very. they essentially have have Russia as a neighbor, because Russia, thanks to Barack Obama, um, Russia basically occupies part of Syria, controls Syria. And without right. Russian acquiescence, um, Israel can't operate against Iran in, in the area. Um and yeah. thus, you know, Naftali Bennett, Prime Minister of Israel, you know, flew, had a mission to Moscow. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that was whether that will actually do anything or was grandstanding, but it's kind of an interesting the way Israel kind of got dragged into this. Right. And it's funny because, you know, you would think the American president would be meeting with Putin in Moscow, but obviously that's not the case here. I, I really I don't entirely understand um, Israel's like very strong role here. I mean, I've read a lot about it, but it, it doesn't quite make sense to me. I think there's so many other countries that also have a sort of, um, mm -hmm. you know, some relationship with both Ukraine and Russia. Um, but Israel is sort of the, the, the peace negotiator right now. It, it's, it's been interesting to watch. Uh, I mean, just the fact that Zelensky is, is Jewish and president of the Ukraine, not, not that the Ukraine, just Ukraine, um, is, is interesting in and of itself to me. Um, I, I wish my grandmother was alive so I could tell her that, you know, Ukrainians elected a Jewish man as their president and he's treated as a Ukrainian. He's not this other thing that we were for so long. He is actually Ukrainian um, and that he is fighting for Ukraine as if, you know, he absolutely belongs. So, it, that, that angle has also been super interesting to me that... Yeah, it, I, I agree. I mean, I think for those... I mean, this is something that is really not mentioned in the mainstream media uh, at all. But for those of us who know the history of Ukraine, know that Ukrainian nationalism, both in the 20th century and in the past, was very much associated with anti-Semitism. So absolutely, yeah. It's, it's kind of turned everything on its head, hasn't it? Right. And the fact that, you know, I, I believe actually when he was elected, he, they also elected a Jewish prime minister. So it was it was a two uh, two election situation where they picked Jews. And it's it's fascinating. I mean, again, I was born in Russia, but I was never Russian. I was Jewish and I was, you mm -hmm. know, my father was from Ukraine and my grandmother was from Ukraine, but they were never Ukrainian. They were just Jewish. And the idea now that Jews can be Ukrainian or Russian or whatever is kind of amazing and really shows that, you know, maybe, we, maybe we've come sort of far where we're accepted in societies where we weren't before. Yeah, that is odd, because if you contrast that with what's going on in Poland, which is a yeah. country which, on the one hand, is very friendly to Israel, at least until recently, but is still a country where there is anti-Semitism, but just with no Jews. I mean, right. there are very few Jews that live in Poland. The Polish Jewish community was wiped out, more yeah. or less. Mm -hmm. um, and yet anti-Semitism is, is still a very important factor there. Um, right. Is it? I mean, I can't believe that there is no anti-Semitism in the Ukraine right. or Russia, but mm -hmm. yet Putin is friendly to the to the Jews there. And Ukraine is led by a Jew. I mean, yes. history is odd. Certainly. Um, the, the of course, turns. you know, from a Jewish perspective, it's also like, is this all going to end up being blamed on us? <laughs> is definitely the concern mm -hmm. of Jews throughout history. Um, is the idea that, you know, Jews are somehow nefarious and involved in countries and starting wars, et cetera. Um, is that going to be part of, you know, why we get attacked? Because uh, we've seen it before and it's not like, we're not exactly uh, comfortable in that region of the world and for very good reason. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. And I, and I think actually the, you know, outsized focus on what Israel does or doesn't do or what it says or what it doesn't say yeah. is actually a piece of that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, turning elsewhere, you've been primarily focused in your writing on local and domestic politics. But mm -hmm. I guess another question I want to ask is, is, do you think Americans have the bandwidth to care about foreign policy for long or think clearly about another important issue, the Biden mm -hmm. administration's efforts to broker a new and far weaker nuclear deal with Iran, with, I might add, the help right. of Russia? Mm -hmm. um, is, is that possible? It, it, the question of whether Americans have the 
the attention span for this is a really good one. Um, it's riveting right now, but what about when it won't be riveting in you know two to three weeks, a uh, month? You know, um, it's interesting. Uh, it also has knocked, of course, COVID off of the main pages, uh, mm -hmm. and I, maybe Americans were ready for a different show because they really <laughs> right. you know, hasn't it's been a great way to put COVID. it. COVID is gone. Um, and so I, I don't know. I don't know. I, in general, I don't think that Americans have the stomach to, um, you know, again, get involved for sure, but even just watch it for a long time. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where we are as a country right now um, and whether we can stay focused on something like this, uh, whether our president can stay focused on something like this. I don't, I don't yeah. know. The question but of whether our president can stay focused is, I think, a slightly different question. But yeah. Well, the whole administration just seems to me like completely out to lunch and they have the whole time. Every time that there's any kind of um, big event, like Joe Biden goes to Delaware for a weekend off. And it's bizarre to me. I mean, just even just by optics standards, they should know maybe this is not the right time to go, but it doesn't seem to matter. So, you know, I <laughs> Yeah, I think that's very true. Also, I'm very concerned um, that, you know, we're kind of missing the thread here in that, um, that there is a real alliance between Russia and China and between Russia and Iran and China. And it's kind of, you know, to, to steal a phrase that David Frum wrote in a speech for uh, George W. Bush 20 years ago, there really is a new axis of evil. Um, and yet we're not connecting the dots uh, as Americans, certainly the Biden administration isn't. Right. Um, so, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, you know, so pre-Trump, um, obviously, whenever anybody would say that Russia is a threat, like Mitt Romney famously did, they would be laughed at. Um, I think my philosophy has always been don't trust Russia. And mm -hmm. I would advise America to live by that philosophy going forward. Um, Even but, better than trust, but, 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 you know, but verify. But verify. Maybe just don't you even just trust. Just don't trust, all. right. <laughs> um, and, and I think the, the, the question of China's uh, obvious one. I, they are absolutely not to be trusted. We, every time I hear about a, a company pulling out of Russia because of this war, like they knew what Russia was doing. I mean, it wasn't like, okay, they, yes, they hadn't invaded Ukraine yet, but you're operating in a country which is under totalitarian rule. Like, you know that your business practices could not, I mean, just the idea that you're, you're conducting business in this kind of environment, um, it is a, is a very questionable decision to me. Um, and, and it's funny because I actually, like, I, I think that um, businesses being allowed to flourish in these countries will help them bring freedom, et cetera. I really do. Uh, but I, I just, the, the surprise of like, wow, I didn't think Putin would do this. And now we're pulling our company out of here. I mean, you know, I, I think that's all a little uh, questionable. And the question of China is one that I feel like we don't, we're not really allowed to discuss or um, talk about in, in any real way because of how much business is being done with China, because of how many American enterprises exist in China. We all have to kind of be on their model of not speaking ill of the country, which is crazy. Uh, and it's only getting worse. Yeah. I mean, just to state the obvious, um, a lot of the people that are you know virtue signaling about Russia, and not to say that they, they're you know they're right to care about what's going on in the course, Ukraine. I, yeah. I agree with them, but mm -hmm. they didn't. You know, the whole country didn't seem to care about the fact that China is committing genocide against the Uyghurs in Western China, right. let alone what they've done already to Tibet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and yet you know, sort of you know, we're banning Russian opera singers if they won't specifically right. denounce Putin. You know, just... who, who's who's asking Chinese people to to denounce uh, Xi uh, right. about uh, the Uyghurs? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I actually have a piece that makes this point um, coming out. And yeah, I, I, I absolutely, that is that is it. The, the completely different way that our conversation is going about Russia versus China is really because of how much American interest is in China. I think all of our sports leagues and um, so many mm -hmm. major companies are deathly afraid of angering the Chinese government and being escorted out. And uh, it really, it, it 
it's uh, it forces the rest of us to be unfree the way that the Chinese people in China are. And I, I don't think we should have any part of that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, let's turn now to a topic that you've written so much about in the last two years, uh, what governments have done in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. I know that at the start of it in March 2020, personally, I was worried um, initially that the yeah. elderly would be sacrificed for the sake of the convenience or the health of others. Mm -hmm. um, while the elderly in nursing homes were indeed sacrificed by governors in states like New yeah. York, New Jersey, and Michigan. Thank you, Andrew Cuomo, Phil Murphy, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, but what instead unfolded was something I think many of us didn't anticipate, policies that sacrifice the best interests and even the health of children for the yeah. sake of the fears of their elders um, that involved not just lockdowns, but school closings and mask mandates that right. were still not entirely done with. Um, can you tell us what conclusions we should draw from that? Oh, this is like uh, so many conclusions. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I was really afraid in March 2020. In fact, I was afraid in February 2020. Um, uh, I had family in Asia and they were saying this virus is going to hit everywhere. Um, and they were saying things like, you know, buy toilet paper, buy paper towels. All of this stuff is going to run out in the supermarket. Um, so I, in February of 2020, I posted a list on Twitter. So many people told me I kept them in, in toilet paper throughout the pandemic because of that. Um, I was also, I, I believe that the masks worked, right? Because that seemed logical to me that you wear a mask and then nothing can penetrate you. But it, it all turned out to be just farce. And um, I think the way that we handled it is terrifying. I We just could not get it right, no matter how many times we did it. And I think we're going to have future opportunities to prove that we didn't learn anything uh, when the South inevitably gets its spike again this summer and then the Northeast gets it again in the fall. I mean, look, I hope it's over. That would be great. Um, I just the, the, the curve has been exactly the same for two years. So unless Omicron really did peter it out for us, um, I absolutely think we're heading right back into the same exact curve that we've suffered through the last two years. And I think we're going to go return right to the mitigation efforts like masking that did nothing. Um, and mm -hmm. it just, it kills me that we keep repeating the same mistakes and never wondering why they're not working. Well, I think with respect to mistakes, you've, you've written a piece that's already come out about why the people not necessarily who lied to us, but who were wrong. And that includes Dr. Anthony Fauci and a whole oh bunch my. of so-called experts. Yeah, well, he did lie about some things. That's true. Um, why they won't just come out and say, okay, I was wrong. Right. Um, but they still identify themselves with science, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, to question it is to be, you know, sort of a troglodyte insurrectionist, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. bad person. Um, why, why, are, why did we get locked into this narrative? Yeah, they can't admit they were wrong and it is just cause, continually causing us problems. Uh, they can't admit the things that they um, just were completely either incorrect about or the paths that they pursued that were just didn't work out. Um, look, I'm super in favor of the vaccine for adults, for example. Um, but I think we've seen that it really doesn't prevent spread. I believed in it. I thought it would prevent spread. I thought we, we had a sure thing and, it, and it's just not that. So the belief in things like vaccine mandates, which didn't do very much at all to control spread, it, it probably had individual effects for people to not end up hospitalized or, or, or dead. But as a public health policy, these mandates did nothing. Um, the vaccine, man mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, masking mandates did nothing, all of that. But, you know, about the lying, there was lying. There was lying. Um, Fauci, you know, even on the most basic level, said that um, we didn't need masks because he wanted to preserve the masks for right. um, healthcare workers. But then he very recently said that um, cloth masks work. And we all know that they don't. It, they do not work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about cloth masks. There's not been a single study that showed any benefit whatsoever of cloth masking. Yet, you know, my children, in, when we lived in New York, continued to go to school wearing their little Batman cloth masks as if they did anything other than cause them to not be understood by their teachers. Um, Fauci also, as I mentioned in the article, campaigned for Biden's um, a stimulus bill. He said that schools can only open if Congress passes the stimulus bill. I mean, that is not the role of a public health official. That is uh, why trust is so damaged um, 
in our country about these public health agencies. Nobody believes them anymore. And they're right not to because they've lied to us and they've politicized the process and they made it so um, if you questioned any part of it, the way, especially Fauci, he made it so if mm-hmm. you questioned him, you were questioning science and he's not science. In fact, a lot of the things he says and does are very unscientific and have nothing to do with science. Um, he's really, I, you know, there's this notorious BIG line got high on his own supply. That is, that is Fauci to me, really high on his own supply. And that's just terrible for all of us. And about Rochelle Walensky at the CDC, they also um, politicized the whole process. They let a a teacher's union head, Randy Weingarten, craft policy last year that kept schools closed. They wanted to um, to make it so um, social distancing in classrooms was three feet. And she pushed it to, to make sure that that didn't happen. Randy Weingarten was directly responsible for how the CDC worded its guidance, which kept schools closed. Um, so all of this is, is to me, really serious and um, will have a profound effect on what people believe and what they don't believe. You know, this may not be our last pandemic. This may not be our last new vaccine. And I don't see people trusting them anymore and and believing what they're saying because they continue to lie to us to this day. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. There's so much about this that we're going to carry around. Certainly children are going to carry this around with them for the rest of their lives. Um, in sort of the way that I, I like to say that my parents' generation carried on, carried the, the depression with them you yeah. know, to, for, the, for their mm-hmm. entire lives. It never left them. Right. But I guess, you know, you mentioned Randy Weingarten, who, you know, there's so much we can say about what she did, yeah. about what she said at one point, even blaming Jews, right. um, even though she's Jewish. Um, right. Why did the teachers' union insist on closing schools and then attempt to blame parents or those who oppose, mm-hmm. you know, damaging mask mandates, pursuing these policies, yeah. to ensure that their political allies depend who that depend on them for donations defended them. What right. where did this come from? I, I really think it was a class thing. Um, the people who were home on their couches baking bread bicycling on their Peloton, um, ordering from Amazon, ordering from Uber Eats, they were of um, you know upper middle or upper class. And the people mm-hmm. delivering the food um, and making the food and packing the packages and, and making their lives, you know, letting them stay home to stop the spread um, were of lower class. And teachers were sort of caught in the middle. If you were going to work, you were lower class. And if you were staying home, then you were higher class. And teachers, I think that the argument for people like Randy Weingarten was um, we will demand a lot in order to make schools function again. I I think that she's directly responsible for things like Glenn Youngkin's election in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're about to see a serious red wave and you can pin that on Randy Weingarten taking away school being important. Turns out parents like school. They, they think it should exist. So when she made it stop existing, um, I, I think so many parents still carry a lot of rage over what what, what happened. I mean, I, I absolutely do. And I think I had one of the better situations where we took our kids to Florida for part of um, the 2020, 2021 school year, um, where they got to go to school every single day. And um, still, I'm bitter about the fact that New York City schools largely closed for that year. I mean, they, they were open on super part-time basis and they would close for months at a time. Um, and, and the way that nobody seemed to care that the rich people were getting tutors and forming pods or going to their summer homes and sending their kids to school there or going to private schools, which were open, obviously. Um, and that no one cared that the, that the poor communities just couldn't do that. And they pretended that that was okay. And nothing about that was okay. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I think you make an excellent point about the class divide. Um, the educated classes, um, including writers like you and me, oh, yeah. we, you know, we certainly our lives were affected by the pandemic, but, you know, some of us were just were, were working at home already um, that was me. or could I, work I, at I, home. I, very, yeah, I was working yeah, from I home mean, the pandemic. I continued working from home. Yeah, as did I. Um and, you know, the educated classes did just fine. Um, mm-hmm. And the working classes did, you know, suffered. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, this goes back to sort of the whole divide about Trump, um, the rise of a sort of new populist politics, um, yeah. and the way our politics have, to some degree, I think, been realigned 
um, with some of our conservative colleagues mm -hmm. is still being so outraged about the educated classes being dissed by Trump that they right. kind of went over to the other side. Um, and, and similarly, people outraged about right. what the educated classes did now coming, you know, over to the Republicans that you didn't think would happen. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I think political realignments happen all the time. Um, so I don't I don't see a problem with the people that used to be on the right um, moving to the left, uh, you know, in re in retaliation or um, just just because of Trump um, or maybe even before Trump or, or even after. Um, I get all that. I just it kind of bugs me that they're considered conservative voices in our mainstream media. Like all the conservative voices in the mainstream media are not conservative. It's just it's sort of an oh, yeah. odd twist on the whole thing. Like I don't mind political um, realignment. And again, it happens all the time. I mean, you have like it's like putting David Horowitz, you know, who famously was a communist uh, and then moved to the right. It's like putting him on as the left wing voice on TV. And everybody knows that they would never do that but for some reason non-conservative conservatives are on every single channel. Yeah, that's right. It's sort of the, the 2007 conservative all-star team, right. um, <laughs> you know, uh, representing conservatism on, yeah. on MSNBC and CNN. Mm -hmm. um, it's mind boggling, um, yeah. you know, and we, I think we both know some of these people, um, but they're getting away with it. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just for a moment talk about those. The ma you mentioned the vaccine mandates mm -hmm. um, and the rules requiring vaccination cards and photo ID, I might add, in states where right. the notion of having to produce a yeah. photo ID to vote was is, is considered racism Racist, um, right. to get into any public event. Um, do you think they, they helped or are. hurt the cause of getting people more va more people vaccinated? I mean, I what do you, OK, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, I haven't seen that it got more people vaccinated um, and it certainly didn't help stop spread, which was really the, the thing that they were mm -hmm. saying that was going to do. It was like, oh, the vaccine mandate is to keep us all safe. So if everybody at this restaurant is vaccinated, none of us will get COVID. And again, look, I believed it, too. If you look at my writing from um, mm -hmm. spring 2021, I am on board with vaccines. I think we are done with the pandemic. I think that we're going to just see numbers sharply decline. Um, but as soon as the summer Delta wave hit in the South, I it, it was obvious to me that that was not going to happen. And yet the vaccine mandates in places like New York came after that. They came in the fall. Um, so right. they saw that the South was having these severe spikes in the summer and they thought to themselves, oh, those rubes, they, they're just not getting vaccinated. But if you looked that most of the states that were getting hit hard were pretty middle of the pack or, you know, or above the pack um, in terms of state vaccination rates, like Florida, you know, the example that everybody always uses um, had above average vaccination rates, but got hit super hard with Delta last summer. And as soon as I saw that happening, I was like, this vaccine, um, can certainly prevent, you know, hospitalization or death, maybe. Um, but it, I no longer believed in it to prevent spread. And Omicron should have ended that discussion altogether. But the vaccine mandate in places like New York, it's paused right now, but it's only paused. Um, right. Eric Adams uh, announced that they were going to pause it and see kind of what happens. Well, what happens is we've had no tourists in New York because, um a lot of places don't even have children's vaccines. And so they can't even come with kids. And a lot of places just aren't vaccinating children. Um, so if you have families wanting to visit, they just won't come to New York. And I, I, I'm sure it has hurt a lot of the tourism business. Um, and this is a reaction to that. Yeah, it's been devastated. Um, I, I guess also, I, and what do you think it says about Americans that so many of us were so flippant about discarding freedoms in the name of dubious precautions? against a seemingly permanent public health emergency. I mean, or yeah. I should say just the perception of their, their, their personal security. Right. I would say it was a perfect storm um, because we were in this insane cancel culture time and the pandemic hit and it was like both kind of united to make sure that outside opinions were not allowed. Um, I, I have, again, I, I took COVID very seriously. I pulled my kids out of school in March, 2020 before schools closed. Um, I was very worried about it, but one of my early tweets about it was I, I tweeted, like, I'm whispering, like, I don't think the government should be able to close businesses. And like, that wasn't really something you were allowed to say, like, oh, this is a public health emergency. I was like, well, I, I still don't think 
the government should have the power to close your business. Um, I, I think that's crazy. Let alone, let alone your house of religious worship. And your school and, and so on. Um, I, I really don't think that we um, knew what was coming. And, and the thing is, I think we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot for sure. I will never buy into anything like this ever again. I think I've, I'm, I've become so much more skeptical. Um, I, and I believed, I believed we would close for two weeks to stop, stop the spread. And when the two weeks were up, I was like, so are we done? And um, they're like, no, no, no we know, weren't. <laughs> another month, another month, another month. And I, by April, I'm like, I'm off the train. I'm no longer um, accepting anything that they're saying. I think that they're lying about everything. There's so many lies that uh, in retrospect that we we know now. Um, I mean, the nursing home uh, directives that you referred to earlier are such a big one because, you know, Cuomo was riding high with this amazing reputation that he had in the media, which looking back is crazy. The guy overseeing the largest death rate, the biggest case count, um, somehow is the hero for running the pandemic well because he gave but everybody loved his news conferences because they were somehow more reassuring reassuring than trump's yeah Yeah, i i admit it in march of 2020 i thought that cuomo was very calming but then by april when we're still locked down no end in sight no discussion of how we get out of this um businesses suffering um schools just completely by the wayside um I am aware that I have made the wrong call in supporting the lockdowns and I mm. am completely snapped out of it by April, but you still can't say that you still, like you, if you read my pieces at that, from that time, I'm calling for lockdowns to end, but I'm saying it very gently, very like, maybe we should think about the fact that we won't have society to come back to if we don't end this soon. Um, but I'm saying it in, in such a gentle way because you don't want to be pinned as crazy, right? You don't want to, this crazy person wants people to die. I mean, I've gotten that for two years um, since then. I mean, I'm Yeah, not- it's like uh, my, my friend, uh, and I think yours as well, Bethany Mandel got called the grandma killer for- Oh, uh, right, yeah. right. Well, she was the, I mean, she was right is the thing. She was saying that, um, yeah. that, you know, she said, call me grandma killer, but I think that shutting down every institution, every organization, every everything- indefinitely is going to harm us all. Uh, we might not have a national zoo to come back to and, and so on. Yeah. Just completely right. All of these organizations are now suffering. Well, yeah, this is what happens. This is what happens when um, you close indefinitely and you're an outdoor function, um, so on. But she was completely right. She called cloth masks being nonsense earlier than most people I know. Um mm-hmm. All of it. I, it, it just, and but you weren't so much of it was like, so she trended on Twitter. She had all these pieces written about what a lunatic she is, um, but she was completely correct. So yeah. it, it's my piece. My last piece in the post is about how I think all these people owe us apologies. Um, and it's funny because it's a pretty scathing piece, but on the right, I've gotten a lot of like, apologies are not enough. Well, look, I'm writing for a mainstream audience at the New York Post. Um, I'm not going to be calling for heads on spikes. Like you're going to have to, um, you know, make your own columns if, you, if that's what you want. But I think that yeah. we are owed apologies by these health agencies, by so many politicians um, who were wrong all along. And yet they were the non-crazy opinion that we were all supposed to be listening to. Yeah, I think that's entirely correct. Um, I know you're currently writing a book about how wokeness hurts children. Yeah. Um, what exactly do you mean by that? And how does this play into the debate about, for example, critical race theory indoctrination in the schools? Right. So critical race theory is just part of one thing that's happening in our schools. There's so many other ways that wokeness is woven through um into our schools uh, in so many different ways that wokeness is imposed on children in schools, but it's not just schools. So the book is about all the different ways um, that wokeness targets children. And actually I'm co-writing it with Bethany Mandel. Um, Ah, So she she and I um, have, we trade off chapters and we, we do a, a deep dive into um, all the different ways that that wokeness targets children and why it's so important to stop it and how to stop it. Yeah. Um, I, you say, you know, obviously CRT is just a piece of it, but mm-hmm. 
it is something that has really altered, you know, it, it's very far reaching because it's about how we think about not just, you know, current politics. It's about how we think about America as a nation, right. um, you know, a nation that was founded not as a nation state of a specific group, but as right. you know, a, a nation state based on an idea. And if we don't believe in that idea anymore, yeah. um, that changes everything, doesn't it? It really does. I think so many people um, have, who, you know, are on the left think that CRT is like teaching about, you know, slavery or something. And that's crazy. Yeah, or, or, or Joe Biden, who said it's just about being sensitive. Right. It's not about just being sensitive. It's about um, breaking everything down into oppressor and oppressed and figuring out your role in that. Uh, breakdown. And it might not always be so simple, um, you know, and, and it's always about the accident of your birth. It's never about kind of who you are or anything about your character. It's always about like who your parents are and how you were born. Um, it's all very demeaning and I think very anti-American. I think in America, you can be whoever you want. I always said this, but, um, you know, when I traveled in Europe and a lot of, a lot of times I would get asked, like, what does your father do? Um, like never in my life did anybody in America ever ask me what my father did. Like no one here cares about that. It's only about what you're doing right now at this moment. Um, it's never about who your parents were and how that, what, how that ties into your life story. Um, so it's it's interesting that it's anti-American and it's so just evil um, and it's spreading. It's spreading because people are again going back to the cancel culture thing, afraid to be called racist. They're afraid to be set to to have um, people say things about them. They're afraid to have their jobs called. This happens all the time now. Um, and it, it's really terrifying that we've let this happen in America. That we've let. Uh, speech gets shut down the way it has and that we've let ideas like this spread as if they are some kind of truth when they're all just a lie. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I think, you know, specifically, one of the things that concerns me is the way CRT and intersectionality, which is, you know, connected to it, right. basically grants a permission slip to anti-Semitism because if Jews are right. classified as beneficiaries of white privilege and if the jewish state the one jewish mm -hmm. state in the world israel is also classified as white right. privilege and colonialism even mm -hmm. though the majority of jews living there are by the definitions of Not intersectionality right. yeah. people of color mm -hmm. um this creates uh you know a, a, a situation where jews can be you know sort of othered in that way and that i right. think is actually happening on the left yeah i, I like to joke like to you know my fellow Jews we're finally white <laughs> like we find mm -hmm. we finally made it when it's no longer uh, a good thing to be white so but Jews were always traditionally left out of that white paradigm I mean go to a prison and try to sit at the white table and see what happens um because mm -hmm. we're not we're right? we we we're, we when it, when it wasn't uh, a good thing to be, when it was a good thing to be white, we weren't. And now that it's not a good thing to be white, we are. It's very convenient. Um, but yeah, Jews absolutely are a giant target of that. And that's why the Women's March, for example, had such anti-Semitism problems. Um, right. it, it seemed like it was okay to hate Jews because they're white and don't we hate white people? But um you know, it, it led to a lot of issues in that march. Um, but I don't think those people even realized that they were doing anything wrong. They were doing sort of what they've been told, which is don't like white people and Jews are white. Yeah, that, that's how these perceptions start. Um, you have written about moving to Florida from New York. I know as a New Yorker at heart, that had to be painful for you. Um, yeah. Speaking as somebody who was born in New York myself, but you did it because you couldn't take what had happened to the city under the misrule of Bill de Blasio, as well as the impact yep. of COVID. Um, is life in the Sunshine State, some of whose citizens now call it a free state, uh, better? And what do you say to those who claim that Governor Ron DeSantis's less stringent COVID policies were dangerous now that you're there? So it's fine. I think I, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure I coined the free state of Florida because I started calling Did you? It, okay. Credit, I think so. Credit, I think giving. so. You know, I, 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 again, I have no evidence, but I, whenever I, I'm I, there, that's what people tell me. I believe you know, I, like, I welcome to the um, free state of Florida. 
I mean, there's just the the joke of the um, whether Ron DeSantis's policies were good for you know good for fighting COVID. Um, or the proof is just in the numbers. Um, the, the idea that Florida is on par with states that lock down um, should give everyone pause because mm. it makes no sense. Florida should have an astronomical death count. Uh, it's, a, it's a very older state. I can tell you, everybody here eats at 5 p.m. Um, it is it is a state of senior citizens, and it should have a death count that far exceeds what it does if the mitigation efforts that Ron DeSantis knew didn't work actually worked. Um, I think he was right about things way before anybody else was. I think he led the way on things that, in retrospect, people now think were easy. Um, like forcing schools to open, not in 2020, but in uh, September of 2021. We, we take it now as, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, September 2021. 20, we right. take it now as a given, as a given that obviously, obviously schools should open this year. But in, in August, uh, when schools were opening in Florida, all the headlines were, you know, four teachers die in Broward County as schools open. Now, why? Why would you highlight the death of teachers over summer break? who were not vaccinated um, as a way of saying the schools shouldn't open. And if ha had he relented on any part of that, schools would be closed today everywhere. It, it is only because Florida provided a test case, a real live test case of a different path on COVID that the rest of the states could follow along. Um, I think places like New York would still be locked, up, locked down right now. I think California would still be locked down right now. I think he did a very brave thing that I will always be grateful to him for. I, he, I have never had a politician have such a direct impact on my life before. Um, I, the last person I could think of is Rudy Giuliani. I think, you know, we, I, my neighborhood in Brooklyn became safer under Rudy Giuliani. It was, it was a tangible change. Things changed by the numbers. And Ron DeSantis is similar to that where I think they both took chances that were, considered crazy. Um, and I think that really goes back to the whole thing where you're not allowed to step out of line right now. And if you do, you're, you're crazy and you're evil and you want people to die. Um, but he really ended up saving the country with a very science-based philosophy in Florida. And I'm all about it. hundred percent love living here and so glad he's my governor. Okay. Uh, that's that's a definitive answer. I, I want to turn finally to something a bit more personal. You recently wrote an essay about feeling disconnected from the Jewish community and your halting efforts to belong. I think it resonated. You say it resonated more than you anticipated yeah, in large measure that. because your experience of the difficulty of finding a niche for your family at a synagogue or a Jewish school is something that right. a lot of other people have gone through. Tell us a little about yeah. what you wrote and the reaction to it. Um, so yeah, I, I've tried really hard to find a Jewish place for my family to belong, both in Brooklyn and now in Florida, and it's been challenging. And the real thing, the reason it's challenging, um, is because the reform and conservative schools are mostly woke and they are prioritize politics, um, over everything else. And they're COVID kind of crazy. Um, a lot of them continue to mask. A lot of them, uh, I, I tell the story in the piece where a friend of mine, uh, was turned away on the high holy days from a shul in Manhattan, uh, because his three-year-old was not vaccinated. And that's crazy that there's no vaccine for three-year-olds. And, and even if there were, you, you should not be turning away families on high holy days who have come to pray because you're afraid. Um, and so I, a lot of things like that have uh, caused me to move away from those spaces, but we're also not orthodox. So the answer to a lot of these um, woke Jewish spaces is, OK, but you find yourself in orthodox shul and you won't experience that, which is probably true. But then we're not orthodox. We don't keep Shabbat. Um, we don't keep kosher at home, et cetera. So it's kind of hard to drive to the shul on Shabbat. Um, you know, when you're not Orthodox and attend an Orthodox shul. So a lot of issues like that, um, I go through in the piece and how adrift I feel from all of it. And the thing is, I really didn't expect how much of a reaction I got from this. I got so many emails from people saying that they are in the exact same situation and they're not all conservatives. Um, 
some of them are liberal or moderate and they think the COVID stuff went too far or they uh, just don't want a lecture when they go to Shabbat. Um, and all of that is really poignant. And Jews are just, we're creating these difficulties for ourselves. Um, the One of the things I talk about in the piece is that for a long time, I thought I could deal with the politics. Like, fine, woke leftist activist rabbi um, at our shul in Brooklyn. Okay. But Jews started getting beat up in the streets um, and it went on for years. And that rabbi didn't say one word about it. I mean, for years did not say one word about it. So if I'm going to have a leftist woke activist rabbi, um, she better be speaking up when Jews are getting beat up in the streets of her own city. And that's really not too much to ask. And that's really where my kind of, you know, plight began here where we, we quit that shul and never really found another one. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, it's, it is a poignant story and it is something that really resonates with so many other Jews who are, are sick of what has happened to the reform and conservative movements and right. are looking for a place. Um, and good luck to all of us uh, with that. Um, Carol, I want to thank you so much for your time, your insights and your perspective. Um, and we'll look forward to having you back after the book is published uh, perhaps Absolutely. with Bethany. Um, we also want to thank our audience, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platform or watching us on the JNS YouTube channel or on JNS, JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story and give us good reviews. Please let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself. And we'll see you again next week.